Good afternoon from Asia Society in Hong Kong. Uh, today is February 16th, 2022, uh, episode 33 of our COVID-19 update. Uh, as some of you who has been with us before know that this series was started uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2020. Uh, and our first guest uh, was Professor Ben Cowling, head of the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at University of Hong Kong School of Public Health. Uh, a year ago, during the height of the uh, Hong Kong's fourth wave, we also invited, invited Professor Cowling back. And, uh, and we're very delighted that this, um, uh, this is the third time, and I'm hoping the third time's a charm. I'm, I'm really hoping that I will not invite Professor Cowling back uh, next year, but if we have to, we will. Uh, but I think uh, today is episode 33, and uh, we're really delighted Professor Cowling is, gonna, is joining us uh, from UK uh, for this conversation. Before we begin our, our conversation, uh, and I just wanna give everybody, those of you especially who are not from Hong Kong may not know the current Hong Kong condition. Uh, and we are in the midst of our fifth wave. In fact, the fifth wave started uh, around January, right after, uh, well, right after the New Year's and everything really things picked up. The COVID numbers the, um, picked up after the Chinese New Year holiday on February 4th. Uh, and a record of this week, we saw a record over I think one day the height was 2,071 cases. Uh, and yesterday, I think it was about 1,600 cases reported, but five, over 5,000 cases suspected cases. Uh, so total fatality so far now is about 227. And, uh, and we currently, Hong Kong is looking at a total number of 26,670. Uh, children as young as three uh, can start their Sinovac vaccine from yesterday. And unfortunately, yesterday, we also saw the youngest uh, in the fatality of a three-year-old uh, who died of COVID, and she had apparently no um, other causes, but I'm sure the case they will look into um, the actual, what happened with the uh, uh, three-year-old. Uh, BioNTech for age five to 11 will be uh, uh, available soon, I, I understand. And hospital beds are reading, reaching 90% capacity. So the government, uh, we have some uh, major issues there in terms of, uh, we really have reached um, kind of a, a capacity issue in terms of the uh, hospital, uh, hospital beds. Uh, government is working on several things and it's extra, Hong Kong government is working on extra testing capacity. Uh, 100 million rapid test kits has been acquired by the government. And I believe priority are given to elderly home workers uh, looking at one test per day instead of three, uh, every, one in uh, every, in three days. Uh, the government also yesterday, uh, I think the CE also talked about 10,000 hotel rooms, uh, I think will be made available possibly for um, uh, COVID patients, and then including a uh, taxi to, dry, uh, to take people to uh, some of these facilities. And she also said there will be no wholesale lockdown. And, uh, and currently, I think the government is buying time uh, to beef up uh, elderly vaccine. And so we're really delighted uh, that we can have Professor Callan with us. And I wanna start off uh, by asking him uh, about the vaccination for the elderly. Um, he has said, I think uh, Ben, you have said in several of your interviews, uh, whether on RTHK or SCMP this last uh, few weeks, uh, priority should be given to the elderly about vaccination. Um, do you still feel the same about that? Yeah, I think so. So what, what we understand is there's still a lot of infections to come, although the case numbers have been very worrying. And you mentioned the rising case numbers. I think today there may be 4,000 something cases. So it is going to keep going up. Um, and, and we still have a long way to go in this epidemic. And we know that elderly and people with underlying medical conditions are the most vulnerable to severe COVID, particularly if they haven't been vaccinated. If they've been vaccinated, it makes a big difference, whether it's BioNTech or Sinovac, it makes a big difference uh, to their prospects if they do get COVID. And I, I think we should be diverting in Hong Kong a lot of resources to vaccinating as many elderly as possible in the coming weeks. We've got a, a very small window of opportunity now uh, because in a couple of months, I think the epidemic will be mostly over. And so we've got to get the vaccines out now. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. 
Um, then what are you, uh, in terms of what are your um, suggestions? I mean, because the elderly there, there was uh, um, uh, some stories recently, I read in SCMP and other, um, some of the elderly, especially those living alone, are really um, hesitant. And, you know, the vaccination rate for the elderly are still quite low. I think it's about no more, it's not even 30% yet, depending on the age group. Um, but so what are you suggesting for the government in terms of getting the elderly uh, vaccinated ASAP? I think the situation with hesitancy has changed a bit in, in recent days because of the case numbers. I have a suspicion that that maybe months ago, maybe last year, uh, that the fear of the vaccine was a was a, maybe a consideration compared to the fear of COVID when there wasn't any COVID in Hong Kong. That's in the, the second half of 2021. We didn't really have any COVID in Hong Kong. And so that's when the vaccination campaign was really going and trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible. But for older people, having seen reports of side effects in, 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 uh, in elderly particularly, uh, there was an understandable fear of vaccination. And at the same time, there wasn't so much immediate concern about COVID. And now it's changed, of course. So I think the hesitancy may have changed, but there's still going to be an issue with access. And I know that some older people cannot go to a, to a community vaccination centre. They're not mobile enough. They need help and so on. Um, and so we, we have to look at how, it, you know, what was the best approach to get as many older people vaccinated as possible. And if they won't come to the vaccine centers or the GPs, then maybe the, the vaccinators can go to the elderly. And I know they are going with teams to elderly homes. Also, they're going to public housing estates and, and other housing estates and putting vaccination booths there. And, and so I, I hope those locations uh, in, in the estates, they're giving priority to older people. So they don't have to queue up for, for in a long line uh, to get vaccinated and so on. I, I just feel like it, it needs a focus. It, it needs a lot of effort and focus and a prioritization to say that, you know, we'd, we'd like to offer vaccine to everybody. But at the moment, the focus has got to be on the elderly and vaccinating as many elderly as possible. Are you currently concerned about what's happening in the elderly homes? I mean, there has been um, a lot of cases, and I think it's kind of started with some of the uh, care workers, but then there's also been cases in elderly homes. Are you concerned about the situation that's developing uh, in that uh, area? Of course. So these, these are the most vulnerable locations. We know in other parts of the world, uh, pre-vaccination and, and, and pre-Omicron perhaps as well, uh, up, up to a third of the deaths were occurring in people in elderly homes, sometimes more than that in, in some places. Now, of course, when vaccines are available, if you can get a, a high vaccine coverage, it makes a massive difference. But in Hong Kong, that's not the case. So we still have largely unvaccinated elderly homes. These are older people living in crowded conditions often. Um, and if the virus gets in, it can spread very fast. And we know that in that group of people, in very frail older people, the mortality rate is high. People have this impression that Omicron is mild. I think that's sometimes a, a false impression. Actually, Omicron is not particularly mild, but if you've been vaccinated, it is relatively mild because the vaccine uh, mi mitigates the illness. Um, and if you've had COVID before, some people have, then Omicron as a reinfection is also milder. But for the elderly in Hong Kong who haven't been vaccinated, haven't previously been infected, I I'm really concerned that we're going to see a lot of consequences of, of the outbreaks that are currently occurring in elderly homes. And I think one way to shield elderly homes would be to require all the staff to test every day. But I don't think that's quite happening yet. It may be a, a plan, but, but until very recently, that, that was not being done. Um, so I, I think that's one way immediately to try and shield elderly homes. But, but uh, we've already heard many reports of elderly homes having outbreaks, unfortunately. Um, and right now, as, as I mentioned uh, in my intro, uh, Right now, the, the kids are getting it. In fact, we've had two uh, deaths, one a three-year-old and one a four-year-old. And yesterday, with the um, availability of uh, one of the vaccines for a kid as young as three, uh, it started. And, um, and, and do you think that's um, the right strategy? I mean, you, you had previously said, I think the priority should be given to the elderly first and then maybe the, the, uh, the children later. Do you still believe that should be the, 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 the case? Oh, sorry, I still think that the priority should be for the elderly. There were these two unfortunate deaths in younger children. And that's unusual. When we look around the world, there's actually very few deaths in children uh, compared to, to other age groups. But uh, of course, COVID can be a severe infection in, in any age group. But uh, I, I hope that we won't see more deaths in children in, in the coming 
uh, couple of months as, as COVID continues to spread. In terms of vaccines, well, we have the BioNTech available for age five and up. And I think today the five to 11s can start getting BioNTech and then Sinovac now goes down to age three. Um, we don't have an awful lot of data on how well Sinovac works in children because there hasn't been a lot of publications uh, either on the effectiveness or in terms of the, the potential side effects, but there's no particular reason to, to worry. Uh, given that Sinovac works in the other age groups and, and there's no issue with side effects, I don't think there'd be a problem with children, but it would be nicer if we did have that evidence to rely on. Uh, in Hong Kong, we can also track how well the vaccines are working. Uh, so I don't think we have a shortage of vaccines. I hope that, that uh, we will be able to see a higher vaccine coverage. My priority would, would definitely be the elderly, but uh, I think it's good for Hong Kong that we have vaccines available for, for most of the population now. But it sounds like, um, you know, it, there is a availability of vaccine, but I think there seems to be a bottleneck right now. Um, um, some of the reports that we've been reading is that some of the elderly would like to get it done uh, ASAP, but they are waiting until because of the registration and so on. They're not able to get their vaccine until March. And I think you're also hearing the same. So is there something else that the government or, or the, you know, the, the, the public health, I mean, that can kind of free up, uh, unbottle neck, you know, the, the free up the bottleneck, so to speak, so that elderly can get kind of ahead of the lines. Well, that, that's exactly what I'm saying about prioritization, that I think there should be some way to, to say. So, for example, there are three community vaccination centers in Hong Kong that are dedicated entirely to children. So we have three out of however many, 10 or 15 vaccination centers that are only vaccinating children five to 11 years of age. And in my opinion, a better use of the, the, the resources there would be to vaccinate entirely elderly and make it an elderly only vaccination center rather than a child only vaccination center. And I think it's important for children to get vaccinated, but, but in my opinion, the priority should go to elderly at the moment. Um, so as you said, given that appointments are not available now until March, but we know that earlier vaccination, particularly of elderly, could save many lives. I, I really think that, that the government's got to look at either creating more uh, vaccination resources, so just expanding the number of vaccination centers and vaccinators, or diverting away and, and unfortunately postponing some of those vaccinations in younger people and younger adults, um, uh, particularly third doses as well, right? But so, so at the minute we have a third dose campaign and, and a, a lot of the doses being given on a day-to-day -day basis are third doses, which certainly help. But if you've got a, a person aged 25, age 30, uh, who's in good health and has already got two doses, I would say I, I think it's okay to postpone their third dose and instead use that vaccine to, to give it to an older person uh, and they might be able to save their life. Uh, okay, today I think one, uh, one of the things I wanna cover um, is still the same topic uh, as uh, a year ago when we spoke, exactly a year ago, February 16, 2021. And I mentioned to you earlier the four topic uh, vaccines, uh, variants and short-term and long-term outlook. So right now I want to kind of turn over um, to talk about uh, variants. And I seem to remember uh, before Omicron, uh, I think you're, uh, I had heard somebody uh, from Hong Kong, you said, Professor Leung's concern, this is before Omicron, that he was uh, worrying about developments, uh, variants coming out or developments out of Africa. And then lo and behold, uh, Omicron out of South Africa. So what are some of the variants that you are concerned about? I mean, Let's try to start off with Omicron first um, in terms of, I think people have misconception about Omicron in terms of being, in, in fact, some people think this is the beginning of the end because of uh, how fast, easily transmissible. So tell us about uh, kind of Omicron from your perspective and what are some of the variants that you are also uh, currently concerned about? Well, so, so if we go back um, probably 18 months to the, to the end of the first wave of the pandemic, that's when we saw the first variant, the Alpha variant. Uh, that was identified in, in Europe, I think in the UK first. Right. Um, and each time with alpha, uh, beta in, in uh, South Africa, I think gamma in, uh, in Brazil or vice versa, and then delta from India, each of those four variants arose when there was a situation with a lot of infections in a population, by the way, that hadn't been vaccinated, a lot of infections and the virus somehow found its way to, to change. And of course, viruses always change a little bit. And if there's a, a way that they change that can help them to spread more easily, then the virus is gonna go in that direction. And that's what's happened with the previous variants. And now with Omicron, it seems to have changed even more. And so that's the, the fifth variant uh, is highly transmissible and is able to escape to some degree the immunity that may have been built up in a population from previous infections or vaccines. 
vaccinations. Now, at the moment, we're hearing about changes in the virus in, in, in different parts of the world. And you know, I, I can see headlines uh, in social media saying this is the latest variant to be scared of and to be worried about. But until we see a, a, a variant really increase in, in incidence in a particular location, like we saw with Omicron in South Africa, where it just shot off, until we see that kind of thing, I, I think um, we have to be a little bit wary about the, the scare stories. But uh, certainly in the coming months, there will be changes in the virus from somewhere in the world that will give it an advantage. And then we'll see that, uh, that kind of evolution, that gradual evolution of the virus um, allow the virus to, to persist and to propagate in the community. So in Hong Kong, we're having a, uh, an issue with Omicron now, but uh, when this is over, we'll certainly face a risk of, of having a new variant. And whether it's uh, an offshoot of Omicron, so a descendant of Omicron that's changed a bit, or whether it's another variant or an offshoot of a previous one, we don't know. And I'm very reluctant to make any predictions given that with, with Delta, we thought that was already quite serious. And then Omicron came out of the blue. Um, I really don't know what, what are the options now, what are the possibilities now, but uh, certainly COVID seems to be uh, able to change and potentially still able to change more in the future to escape immunity and to, to be able to cause more epidemics. But I will say that in most parts of the world, there's not so much to fear from COVID anymore because the high level of immunity in the population uh, will prevent uh, severe, severe disease. So in South Africa, when Omicron hit, they had an awful lot of infections with Omicron and there wasn't too much in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. And that's because of the immunity in South Africa from previous waves of infection with the original ancestral virus, also with the beta variant. And then they, they came uh, Delta as well, the third wave, and then they had Omicron. And by that time, uh, there was a lot of immunity already. I think most of the world having experienced Omicron waves will now be in a similar situation to South Africa where future waves of the virus will occur. If there are people that are vulnerable, they do still face a particular risk, but people in general who've been vaccinated or who've had previous infections or both will not have to worry so much about COVID. It will tend to be more of a common cold or a flu-like illness in general, and it will, will still cause uh, a, a public health issue. It, it will still cause hospitalizations, but uh, it, it won't be at the level that justifies uh, widespread public health measures in most parts of the world uh, in, in the future. So here in Hong Kong, it's not just Omicron, we're also uh, facing some Delta cases. So I guess what you're saying, if uh, if this fifth wave gets us uh, really uh, vaccination rate up for all age group, uh, we would have less to fear uh, with the with other variants? Is that is that? Well, so I, I think right now we've got lots to fear because I think Omicron is going to spread for a while longer and a lot of people are getting get infected in, in the next couple of months but when that's over when we think about the summer and we think about what's been built up in Hong Kong in terms of the immunity from a lot of vaccinations including third doses and also by that point a lot of infections at that point I don't think we'd have much more to fear from COVID and I think there would be a very strong case to be made that we don't no longer need public health measures at that point but unfortunately that would be in the summer after having experienced a, a, a lot more impact of this fifth wave, unfortunately. So at the minute, I, I, I still think it, it's, it's better for Hong Kong if we can focus on the fifth wave and try to mitigate as much as possible, try to slow down the spread um, and, and prevent as much as possible. But uh, looking to the future, hopefully this may be the end of the pandemic for Hong Kong because uh, after this fifth wave, I, I think we'd have such a high level of immunity that there would be nothing much to fear from, Hong Kong, uh, from COVID anymore. So right now, I think um, I think the, some of the question I saw earlier from um, uh, audio, we have already have a lot of questions coming in from Slido and others. Um, is the zero um, a dynamic zero COVID strategy? I think Hong Kong and um, China are at, at two places that are you know still uh, mainland China zero COVID strategy, and and is this is one of the reason I guess that China because they have not had that much in fact today uh, that much exposure of Omicron. In fact, today, mm -hmm. I think the paper said there was about 80, 80 some cases uh, in various parts of China. So is that one of the reasons that they have to kind of hold on to, or that we also have to kind of hold on to the zero COVID strategy? Well, po yeah, possibly. possibly. So, so the, the zero COVID strategy, as it was called maybe a year ago, has now changed to being called the dynamic zero COVID strategy. And I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of how to understand it. Uh, there's really two phases. So the phase we had 
uh, in the second half of 2021 was keeping the virus out of the community. We haven't got any COVID in the community. We want to keep it out. And the critical issues there are the travelers, the quarantine on people arriving and, and being very alert for infections in air crew, in hotel workers, uh, quarantine hotel workers, uh, people that work at the airport and, and the container terminal and so on. And we did a pretty good job of that. We knew that it was inevitable that infection would come in sooner or later. Um, and that's where the dynamic part comes in. With dynamic zero COVID, particularly in mainland China, there has to be a very rapid transition. When you're at zero, it's fine and, and everything can, can relax domestically. But when you have an outbreak, all of a sudden have to really, really try hard to get the outbreak under control as quickly as possible. And if you look in mainland cities, they, they have a handful of cases. Already there's a mass lockdown. There's repeat mass testing of everybody in the city. To, and they identify cases they didn't even know about. But then isolating those, contact tracing and quarantine in their contacts uh, can be done within a short space of time. And the total duration of the lockdown for the city as a whole is maybe a, a week or two. And then the people that were infected and their contacts need to stay in isolation or quarantine for longer but the rest of the city can go back to normal. Um, and so that's why it's dynamic because it's keeping on your toes. Um, you know, everything's okay at zero, everyone's happy. When there's an outbreak, suddenly you need to, to, to really try hard to, to stop things, to control things. In the mainland, I, I don't see any, uh, any plans. I, don't think, I can't see any plans uh, why they would go away from that strategy, why would they would change that strategy. Now, Omicron is still a threat. And I would be worried about a, a, a widespread outbreak in the mainland of Omicron, um, causing a lot of disruption, um, kind of setting off city by city lockdowns a, across different parts of the country. If you remember last year in the summer, there was a Delta outbreak that went across much of the country and, and caused a lot of disruption. And Omicron could, could cause even more disruption than that. But I, I would imagine that in the mainland, they're going to continue the dynamic zero COVID strategy for longer. And that means for Hong Kong, we actually have an issue. So I just said to you a, a moment ago that I think in the summer, by the summer, there wouldn't be much public health rationale to continue with zero COVID. And of course, there's two big advantages to the zero COVID approach uh, in the mainland. One, uh, one advantage is that, uh, oh, sorry, in, in Hong Kong, one advantage for zero COVID is that we can minimize the impact of COVID in the community in terms of the infections and the hospitalizations. And uh, we can uh, avoid the kind of disruption that, that we've heard actually this week in, in our hospitals. That's one advantage. The second advantage for Hong Kong is the potential for quarantine free travel into mainland China, because I know a lot of people in Hong Kong have business reasons to go to the mainland or family reasons to go to the mainland. And that's a real, you know, really something to try and set up is a quarantine free travel bubble. Now, in the summer, one of the two reasons for dynamic zero COVID in Hong Kong may have gone, but the other reason will still be there. So I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that in Hong Kong, even after a very large fifth wave, uh, even after the public health rationale for zero COVID um, no longer being there, that there's still this other rationale of potentially being able to do a travel bubble that might see the, uh, the government in Hong Kong continue to, to try to pursue a zero COVID approach. And if that's the plan, then actually right now that, that would make sense why they haven't relaxed the travel restrictions, for example, um, even though there's, there's, there's no need to have travel restrictions today, they're still in place. And that may be because the, the, they're planning to, to keep them in the longer term. Um, so I, I don't know. It's very difficult to, to predict what might happen because the virus can change. Something else may change as well. But uh, uh, yeah. So that goes to my question. Um, I think you kind of partially answered it. I mean, why, you know, right now, um, uh, COVID cases, local COVID cases is so much higher than the imported cases. And, uh, and, and so some of the questions, I think from some of our um, uh, members or audience out there who are in currently in quarantine for those who are coming from outside of Hong Kong, um, and the question is, should government loosen up quarantine uh, for those coming from outside? Because the numbers are, are quite low and uh, uh, why wouldn't they? And, and I think you partially answered it, but I think uh, and also in one of the cases, uh, I think some of the elderly home quarantine, they have lessened it down to one week instead of uh, 14 days. So why wouldn't that also apply to uh, those in, in hotel quarantine from uh, those coming from abroad? What, what I think would make a lot of sense now would be to, to line up the quarantine policies for the local close contacts and also for the people coming in from overseas. Because the, if we did, open up a bit more to travel from overseas, there would be cases coming in. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there are some 
cases that turn out to be more severe and then they do need to go to hospital and that does put additional pressure on the hospitals when they're already under pressure i understand that at the same time there's a lot of people that that are overseas that that uh would like to go back or even need to go back because of these issues or whatever and at the minute are not able to and given now there's so many cases in the community there's really no current rationale for the travel measures um if you have 4000 cases today what's the difference if there's another five that come in on an airplane um or, or, or 10 uh, and we know that the 4000 local cases and, and is not the total number of infections whereas on the importations you really do pick up everybody um but uh so so my 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 question is really wh- whether there's a plan to keep the travel measures in place in the longer term and if that was the plan then it would actually make a lot of sense not to relax them now because if you relax it now um and then the airlines start thinking about coming back again and and people start thinking about traveling again but in a couple of months time it stops then it's 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 a lot of disruption for everybody and i know quite a lot of airlines have already said they they don't plan to fly to hong kong in in the coming months because it it's what well, i had to say in a in a in a diplomatic way i think the impression was it was too much trouble to fly to hong kong because they they set up a route and then they got a flight ban and then they they waited out the 14 days and they they started again and then the next day they got a flight ban again and so what what airline wants to do that when it's, it's you know they they got other places they can fly uh, unfortunately it's only cathay pacific that's the domestic airline that's that's suffering the most from all of the disruptions Well, I hope they survive and uh, because there are only airline uh, here in Hong Kong and we hope them uh it's been really tough uh on all of us here at, here in Hong Kong being really locked in for this last uh two years and uh and and uh even though some of us had a, an op- opportunity to travel last year for unfortunate circumstances it's still very tough uh for 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 what we're going through right now but Uh so one of the questions I I think uh one of our board member um also asked uh me to ask you was uh can you also compare and contrast um you know you're in UK uh, what's happening with Hong Kong and, and the rest of the world you're in UK now you've been there for 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 a few weeks and so on so uh and I asked that question a year ago so what compare and contrast right now um I I don't know if anybody is seeing it right but you know uh, just kind of the way we're dealing with covid as as of this moment hong kong's policy of zero covid versus those others who are uh, my understanding taiwan is opening up um new zealand australia almost everybody uh, is opening up um and singapore opened up a long time ago and their numbers certainly is is uh, covid numbers through the roof but their mortality rate is still not not that high so uh, that's the question hong kong and singapore that everybody has different policy so can you from your lens uh talk a bit about um this compare and contrast hong kong strategy sure i think if you go back probably three months then actually hong kong looks like it is done probably one one of the best places in the world in terms of how it's handled covid um certainly the first 18 months of the pandemic in hong kong we did really really well we kept infections to a low level uh, we kept mortality to a very low level we got the vaccines in um and and minimized disruption i would say domestically compared to some other parts of the world that had prolonged lockdowns i think melbourne was under lockdown for for many many months and in hong kong we never had a total lockdown uh so there were the travel restrictions there was school closures and i know that many children have have hardly been to school in the last two years but in in general uh i think hong kong fared fairly well now in europe there's a there's a different situation they were not able to get cases down to zero that i think that the zero covid approach would have been infeasible in european countries so they had repeated waves because if you don't get the case over down to zero then as soon as public health measures are relaxed domestically the infections start to come up again and and so they had these ups and downs these waves of infection over the first 18 months of the pandemic but now in europe i think denmark has said they they've relaxed all their public health restrictions all the public health measures the uk pretty much relaxed everything as well other european countries are still battling omicron but fairly soon i think the numbers will be coming down and they would also be relaxing their measures and i would see that as for europe the end of the pandemic when the public health measures have gone and there's no further concern about covid that's not to say that they might they might need to bring something back if there's a new variant uh, in the summer or the next winter maybe they'll need to bring something back but we do that for other infections from time to time uh, i would say the pandemic looks to me like it's is over it it is considered over in europe um fairly soon in denmark and the uk pretty much already 
um, in, in other parts of the world, in, in uh, North America and South America, generally similar. I would like to talk about Singapore because that's a, a location that followed more closely the, the strategy in Hong Kong in the first 18 months. And then in Hong Kong, we compare ourselves to, to Singapore and you know, we try and do a little bit better. And I think in the first year, year of the first 18 months of pandemic, we did better. I think if you look at the, the situations, uh, we kept the case counts fairly low. We had long periods of time with zero cases. Singapore also had their, their good days, their good, their good months. Um, but Singapore had a, a different strategy starting about a year ago, where in Singapore, they said very clearly, they don't think they can sustain the zero COVID approach. And they don't think that it's justifiable to sustain the zero COVID approach in the long term because they really value their international connections, the, the opportunity to travel and, and to, to, to do business with, with the region. Um, and in Malaysia, of course, they have a lot of people coming across the border from, from Malaysia, from Singapore to Malaysia and vice versa every day, just like we did with the mainland. So in Singapore, they had a very clear exit strategy. And that was announced a year ago, I think, when they, when they started to vaccinate. So they said uh, that they've got this overall strategy in mind to get the vaccine coverage up as high as possible and then progressively relax their public health measures step by step. They're not going to drop everything all at once because they know that would be very, very dangerous. There might be a, a flood of cases all at once. So they're going to relax step by step gradually. Uh, they know there's going to be an exit wave. They know there's going to be infections. But if they can stay on top of things as much as possible and keep the vaccination coverage high uh, now with third doses as well, then they don't have too much to fear. And I think it's right. I think if you look at Singapore, they don't have a lot to fear from COVID. They're doing pretty much the right thing. And I think the model that they've got in Singapore would actually be an excellent model for Hong Kong to exit um, or for Taiwan or, or for other places, Australia, New Zealand as well, who were looking to exit from zero COVID. You get the vaccination coverage really, really high. You communicate with people that they are going to face the risk of COVID and they would probably be, be better for them if they were vaccinated. Um, if, if there's reluctance to get vaccinated, you can look at strict the measures, look at incentives for vaccination. And the absolute last ditch of thing is to do a mandate to say, okay, if you absolutely refuse and there's too many people refusing, um, then they're going to have to do mandates or vaccine passes or whatever. And in Singapore, the vaccine coverage is very, very high. So you can see even when they have large case counts, really that the impact in terms of hospitalizations and severe cases is still very low and still manageable. And I think it won't be too long before they can relax even more public health measures um, and, and then eventually return to, to normal. It may not be completely the same as before COVID. It would be a new normal, but I think it would be pretty normal in Singapore uh, fairly soon within a few months' time. Um, and, and for Hong Kong, we, we can look at that as an alternative um, because if we go back to zero COVID with, again, the strict travel restrictions and potentially even, even a more stringent kind of plans for dealing with a, a sixth wave, because now we're having our fifth wave, if the consequence of the fifth wave is just... With, the government to say we don't want a sixth wave so we've got to do even more things to, to try and stop that from happening then i think that's a very different strategy to, to what's been done in singapore and also australia and new zealand um right now um i think one of the question from uh, from the audience is um kind of what is the cost of all this uh here in hong kong uh in terms of reducing the standard of living here in hong kong uh, and poor educational experiences, uh, suppression of economic activities. Um, you know, are we ready to, I mean, I guess the cost of this, uh, this you know, this, this strategy, uh, are, 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 is the government who is asking these questions? Uh, what, what do you think of, of this, uh, this question? No, I, I asked the same question. I think Singapore, they, they said very clearly that they don't think it's justified to continue zero COVID when vaccines are available for those exact reasons that they no longer see it. They, they don't want their children to, to be schooled online for years to come. They don't want to have the travel restrictions so that people can't travel for years to come. And with vaccines available, you can get the immunity in the population to a high enough level that COVID no longer poses a, a major threat anymore. Of course, without vaccines, you don't have a lot of options because as, as we've seen around the world, if you have a large epidemic in an unvaccinated population, it's, it's, it's disastrous. Um, so in Hong Kong, we, we still have those considerations, but the government may, may have to weigh up a lot of different things. So they've got to weigh up the, the potential for quarantine free travel with the mainland, for example, and that would have enormous economic benefits to Hong Kong and, and a lot of Hong Kong people would, would like that to happen. So that would be one thing in the other column. And I think for, for governments everywhere in the world, they've got to tally up what are the pros and cons of, of the different options and the different strategies, and then try and come to a decision that's in the best interest of, of their 
the population that they serve. Um, and it, in every part of the world, those those factors may be different. And so I, I, I yeah, I, I can understand what, why decisions are being made, but I agree with with the question, uh, the, the the commenter that that, that uh, I, I think with a high vaccine cover the rationale for zero COVID is much weaker uh, than it was maybe a, a year ago. And I really think for Hong Kong, one of the, the serious options is to, to try to gradually relax all the public health measures after the fifth wave. And so, and, and aim to get back to something like normal. Um, and I think that would be feasible. Well, we're now, um, we have a lot of question coming in and, and uh, thanks to Professor Cowling, we will, if we need to, we'll stay a bit later um, to answer as many questions as we can. But one of the question uh, from the audience from Daniel is, is there any evidence the severity of Omicron uh, may be higher for a population group, including children like Hong Kong's, uh, which has been sheltered uh, from uh, prior variants? Yeah, so there, there's two issues with severity and in, in different age groups. So the first thing is whether a particular age group can even get infected. And in the early days of COVID, it was actually quite rare to see COVID in children. So they didn't tend to get it. But if they, they did get it, it wasn't necessarily mild. Um, and there have been deaths in children reported around the world in, in the first year or two of the pandemic. But it's very unusual. Now what we're seeing with Omicron is the virus has changed somehow. And it it's able to infect the upper airways more. For whatever reason, it's able to infect children much more easily than ever before. Delta also infected particularly older children much more than before. So now we're seeing a lot more infections in children. That means that we will start to see more severe, the more severe end of the spectrum as well. I don't know whether the intrinsic severity in a child has changed that much. If two years ago there was a child with COVID, it would generally be mild, but, but there would be a, a small risk of severe disease. Now with Omicron, uh, there's a much higher chance of infection, but in terms of severity profile, I don't know if it's very different, but because the risk of infection is already much higher, there's a much stronger rationale for vaccinating children than maybe a, a year ago when, when COVID wasn't really an issue in children. Um, so I, I don't know whether to say that the intrinsic severity has changed, but certainly the characteristics have changed and, and COVID now poses more of a threat to children than it, than it did a year ago. Um, here, another question is uh, information on the efficacy of Sinovac versus BioNTech and other vaccines in terms of uh, uh, lowering uh, severe and fatal CFRs. The yeah, fatality well, I, rates? We, I, I really hope that we'll be able to get some local data on this because in, in Hong Kong, we have excellent sources of data. Uh, we, we have the potential to be able to answer that question in Hong Kong to say what's the level of protection that two doses of Sinovac are providing, or three doses, or, or BioNTech, two doses, or three doses, or even the crossover. I know some people have, have crossed over from one to the other for their third dose. Um, and I know there's an issue with, with, uh, with waning. So in other parts of the world, there's very clear evidence that if you've just recently got your second dose, you've got a high level of protection against uh, severe Omicron. But as time goes on, if it's now three months, or six months, or nine months since your second dose, that protection has weakened over time. And that's why third doses are being given um, to, to people. What we don't have though in Hong Kong is the comparison to say that if you got uh, Sinovac or BioNTech with a second dose six months ago, what's your level of protection now? And how, how much of a priority is it for you to go and get a third dose? Because we, we know that neither of those vaccines will do a brilliant job in, in protecting against infection uh, because Omicron's changed a bit and, and it's able to escape some of that protection against infection but both vaccines will likely provide some protection against severe disease. The question is how much? And, and I really hope that we can get some evidence on that, that we can, we can uh, find out in Hong Kong. Because I, I don't really have a, a good idea what, uh, of what that might be. In the UK, there's estimates that for BioNTech, uh, if it's soon after your second dose, there's a very high level of protection against Omicron hospitalization in, in the probably 80, 90% range. But after, after, six months after the second dose, this dropped with Omicron to more like 50%. And if BioNTech's only giving 50% protection against hospitalization uh, six months down the road, then I, I, I'm sure Sinovac is going to be a little bit lower than that just because it's a bit of a weaker vaccine. Um, but, but I don't have a, an estimate of what that would be. But uh, I, I hope that we'll, we'll be able to find out soon because I think it's critical to inform people, particularly uh, who got vaccinated uh, earlier last year, to, to go and get their third dose, that it actually is really important to get a third dose as well. 
Uh, one of the things I, I want to stick with a vaccine question, and and one of the things that I've been hearing about the second generation of vaccine um, that that some of the um, a pharma company are working on, and including China. China does not have their own mRNA vaccine yet, and I understand they're they're developing, they're working on it. So, um, and and I had heard um, co former colleagues and friends who who did not want to take the first generation of uh, vaccines, they're waiting for the second generation. Uh, and now with Omicron, I think many of the pharmaceutical companies are developing. So can you, any information that you have on, you know, some of this research in the second generation of, of, of uh, vaccine, uh, including what China is working on uh, in, for their own mRNA vaccine? It's right. So it, at the moment, we've got the mRNA vaccines, we've got the, the viral vector vaccines like the AstraZeneca vaccine in other parts of the world. There's the inactivated vaccines like Sinovac and Sinopharm. And then there's also a type of vaccine, which is a, a protein-based vaccine, which is just part of the virus, not the whole virus. It's just part of the virus that's injected to give an immune response. And Novavax is an example of that one. So there's four main technology groups. Um, I know some people have been wanting to wait for Novavax because it's a, it should be a very nice vaccine to get. It should have a very good immune response and a lower level of reactogenicity, a lower level of, of reactions after vaccination. We don't have that in Hong Kong yet. Some places do have it. But these vaccines are all the first generation vaccines. In the mainland, I know they're developing their own mRNA vaccine. I wouldn't really think of it as a second generation vaccine. I would still think of it as a late first generation vaccine. Right. And if it works out, it should have a performance similar to the BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. But there's been other mRNA vaccines that haven't performed as well because it's not easy to work with that technology. So we'll have to see how their clinical trial pans out. But uh, for the mainland, if it does work out and then they have their own domestic mRNA vaccine, they could use that as third or fourth doses across the mainland and, uh, and get a higher level of, of protection in the mainland with that. In the medium term, there are plans, I suppose you could say, or hopes that we might have more effective vaccines. Remember that right now the BioNTech vaccine is actually not that effective in, in preventing Omicron infection. It's very good in limiting severe disease, but it's not that good in preventing infection. And ideally, we'd like a vaccine that prevents infection as well, ideally. And so maybe in, in the second generation of vaccine technologies, there would be like a nasal spray vaccine that can stop infection or some other maybe, maybe different design in the vaccine that makes it a, a, a much stronger vaccine in preventing not only severe disease, but also infection. But I, I don't know how long that's going to take. And I certainly wouldn't advise anybody to wait for that because who knows if it, if it will be ready soon or not. Um, I don't think there's anything imminent in, in that direction. So right now we, we have the vaccines available that are already very good in preventing severe disease particularly. And I would recommend anybody who hasn't yet been vaccinated to go and get vaccinated. Uh, one other question, uh, this is from Siniza. Uh, can you elaborate on T-cell research and COVID? Uh, how can we use this information to fight COVID? Well, right. So in our immune system, we have different components which have a different role to play in terms of immunity. And our first line of defense, if the virus gets anywhere near us in our body, is the antibodies. And antibodies are pretty easy to measure in the laboratory. There's a lot of labs can do antibody testing. And to some extent, it's relatively standardized in the sense of, of different machines. You, you, you know what, what the number means when you get the number out of the machine. Uh, for antibody levels. And we know with the vaccines available in Hong Kong, Sinovac and BioNTech, there's a big difference in terms of the antibody levels. And that matches what we understand about how well the vaccines uh, protect against infection, at least before Omicron, where the BioNTech vaccines were, were like 95% effective against mild infection, whereas Sinovac, Sinopharm were 50s and the 60s, maybe the high 60s at most because of the lower level of antibodies. But in our bodies, we have a second line of defense. So if we do get infected, if the antibodies aren't enough or whatever, or the virus gets around them, even when we do get infected, there's a second line of defense. And that's involving the cells, the white blood cells in our body, including T cells, and also still to some extent antibodies and maybe other immune uh, components. And those, that second line of defense can help to ameliorate, to kind of soften or, or, or minimize disease severity. And so in vaccine research, people would often study T cells as well. And if there's a good T cell response to a vaccine, that would indicate maybe even if you, if you could still get infected, you'd have a milder disease. And so that's that second line of defense. But unfortunately with T cell research, it's not so easy to do. Only a few labs can do it. Most labs cannot. 
you need specialized techniques and every lab likes to do it in their own way. There hasn't been so much standardization. So it's actually difficult to, to compare. If, if I told, told you antibody level on, on a particular machine to another scientist, I think they'd be able to tell what that number means in terms of protection. But if I talk about T cells, you know, I, in my study, I've got a T cell level of this or that. And then someone else in another lab may, may not know exactly what it means because they need to know so many other details about how it was measured and what was done. So in scientific research, we don't have such a good understanding of, of what exact role T cells are playing in immunity. Uh, we know pretty well that antibodies are playing a major role, particularly in protecting infection. But for T cells, we, we, we generally tend to see experts wave their hands a little bit more and say, well, you know, there's a good T cell response to the vaccine. So that, that means it's going to protect against severe disease. But um, uh, one, one thing I would say to, to, to be very alert for is, for example, with the, the Pfizer vaccine, the BioNTech vaccine in the UK, there's a very good T cell response, of course, to the Pfizer vaccine, uh, very good level of protection against infection in the early days after the second dose, very good level of protection against severe disease, but that's waned after six months. And with T cell responses, they tend to last for much longer. They don't tend to wane so quickly. So I'm not sure what to what extent the T cells are playing a role in protection against severe disease and to what extent it's the antibodies that are limiting infection to start with. And if you don't get infected, you can't get severe disease. Uh, maybe T cells don't have such a major role to play, but uh, that may be a little bit too technical for your audience. It's, uh, it, it's still a very active area of research to try and understand exactly what the vaccine is doing and how it's, it's providing protection. And if we could understand that, we could also make projections into the future that would inform third dose timing, fourth dose timing, and so on. So it's an active area of research for me and, and for my colleagues. Great. Well, this is a more specific question of when will Omicron Taylor vaccines be available? Or by the time it's available, is it too late? Uh, well, they're being tested now. I know that there's some reports from, from some of the vaccine companies that they have Omicron specific vaccine. I think some companies even have multivalent vaccines, meaning they have a vaccine with two strains, the original strain plus the Omicron strain. So you get two strains in one vaccine. Um, but, but I think as far as I understand, the early results from those trials that have been reported indicate that the, the addition of the Omicron strain doesn't actually make that much difference in terms of the levels of immunity to Omicron compared to just using the original vaccine. That makes a little bit of a difference, but not an enormous difference. And that, that's a little bit surprising because you would have thought if you could do an Omicron vaccine, it would be really good for Omicron. But it seems, at least with the early indications, that that may not be the case, unfortunately. Um, and there's some theoretical reasons why that might happen. So if you've already, if your first vaccine is to the original virus, and then you get a second vaccine to Omicron, sometime it can stimulate as much of the response to the original virus, just because that's what your body's already familiar with. And then a little bit of an extra response to Omicron. Whereas if you got the Omicron vaccine first, then it's a different story. You, you get a really good immune response to Omicron. So I don't actually think we, we'll see vaccines for Omicron soon. And vaccine companies may not want to change their recipe in the factories because they have to put the factory on pause while they update everything. And then they need to run it through and make sure everything's working properly. And that delays vaccine production for, for weeks or potentially because of that changeover to the new, to the new recipe. Um, so they, they may think that they'll just keep going with the original virus for now um, and maybe wait to another variant which is even more different. And then at that point, think about changing. But uh, one of the, the issues we have with flu, I've been working on influenza for, for many years. One of the issues we have with flu vaccines is that the vaccine strains are always behind. So we have a new strain of, of flu that comes out. And then six months later, we have a vaccine available for that strain because you know, we, we know that's important, but it's almost, you know, it, it's come in too late. If it had been available six months earlier, it would have been ideal but we didn't know that's what the flu strain was going to be. And there's a lot of research on trying to work out what's going to be coming and trying to get a little bit ahead of the virus. Because if you can have a vaccine that's ready more, more quickly, it can do even more good. I worry that with, with COVID, we're going to follow the same kind of pattern where we have a, a variant like Omicron, it spreads, spreads very widely. And then a few months later, we have an Omicron vaccine. And then it, you could get the Omicron vaccine, but who knows what the next variant is going to be. And so the vaccine's always trying to play catch up with the virus. And, and that's not ideal. Uh, one of the question here um, uh, on Slido asks, and this was uh, uh, 
published a, a few weeks ago, the Euro Chamber, European Chamber of Commerce suggests strict measures in Hong Kong will remain until late 2023 or early 2024. Uh, can you share your thoughts on this? Well, I, I did look at that and I, I don't have any reason to dispute the findings in the sense that I, I don't think anyone really knows what the timing is and the policy in Hong Kong will have to take into account what's the policy in the mainland. So if in the mainland China, they're not planning to relax their, their dynamic zero COVID approach anytime soon, then in Hong Kong, we, we may be in the same boat that we may also be following dynamic zero COVID and until sometime in the future that the situation changes. And I don't know whether that be 2023, 24, or earlier than that, or later than that is very difficult to say, because I don't know what, what would lead to a change in the policy in the mainland. Now, as I said to you earlier, Alice, in, in Hong Kong, the rationale for dynamic zero COVID would have changed within a few months time because of the high level of immunity that we have in the population at that point. So in Hong Kong, we could consider having a different strategy to the mainland if that's possible. But, but in, in that case, we could be open to the world a little bit sooner. But I, I don't know whether that's an option or whether that's the option that would be chosen. Uh, but that would certainly, in my opinion, be, be a, an option to consider. Well, I think going back to the China mRNA question here, um, you know, I think it says it appears that the temporary zero Hong Kong zero COVID strategy will depends on, like you said, uh, mainland rollout of uh, their own mRNA. Uh, any sense of timing, uh, timeline on the mainland? Uh, and the question really is, might they deploy Fosun BioNTech? Well, certainly they might do, but, but I would remind you that- But why not? Up, so, well, so we've done studies in Hong Kong looking at, 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 at three doses. So you get the inactivated, inactivated, and then you get an mRNA boost. The immunity from that is not actually that good. So let's say the best case scenario that the Chinese mRNA vaccine comes out similar to BioNTech, and they want to use that as a third dose. Actually, the level of immunity that you get from that is not particularly high. So I don't know why that specifically would change the direction and the strategy in mainland China. If they're saying that at the minute they're not comfortable with the level of immunity in the population and they think zero COVID is a safer public health strategy for the mainland, I can understand that. I don't think that equation has changed too much by the availability of an mRNA vaccine. And we've heard, I don't know if it's published, but I heard reports a study in Israel looking at the fourth dose with an mRNA vaccine. So that was Pfizer, so BioNTech four times. Uh, the, and the fourth dose didn't also didn't make that much difference to immunity. And so in, in the main, even if you say they get the mRNA vaccine and they do a third dose and a fourth dose, that may still not change the equation for zero COVID in the, in the sense that, you know, in an ideal world, if you had a vaccine that was brilliant and you waited until that vaccine is available and then you give it to everybody, and then you can relax all the public health measures and, and there's no impact because, because you've got such a high level of immunity from your brilliant vaccine. But uh, I, I don't know whether that scenario is, is possible, is, is conceivable. And so in the mainland, I, I understand that's one of the potential triggers for, for, for the mainland to exit zero COVID. But at the minute, I don't think that's a particularly uh, strong likelihood in the near future anyway, even if the mRNA vaccine works out. And you're correct, they could choose to use the Fosun uh, a pathway to get BioNTech into the mainland because Fosun was, I think, the first investor into BioNTech for the COVID vaccine before Pfizer. And so they, they have the potential to get that vaccine in. I don't know what, why they're waiting because I think that could, that could make a big difference in the mainland. Um, but if their domestic vaccine works out, of course, maybe they'll prefer to go that fast. Um, if it doesn't, then maybe they'll go with plan B. That might be the Fosun vaccine, I don't know. Or maybe they'll just, just hold on. Because, I mean, you, you can see in the, in the mainland, they have very few COVID cases in the past year. There are outbreaks from time to time in some cities. I think Siam was one of the biggest with thousands of cases. We've probably already exceeded that in Hong Kong in terms of the size of that outbreak. And most cities in China have not had outbreaks in the past year. There's a lot of cities in China, a lot of big cities in China that have not really had COVID outbreaks. So actually, vaccination is not a priority in places that are doing zero COVID and doing it really well vaccination is not necessarily a priority. You could just keep going with zero COVID, um, particularly if the vaccines are, are, are not highly effective vaccines. Uh, here we have a, a question about Israel and you mentioned Israel uh, has been uh, coming up with a lot of data about the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth jab. Uh, why is Israel leading in COVID death rate? Even the most of its population is quadruple vax. It's not true that most of the population is vaccinated. Actually, in Israel, the vaccine coverage is not that high. And that's a, that's a misunderstanding about Israel. 
Actually, in many countries in the world, the vaccine coverage is not as high as, as you might imagine. Um, there's many places in the world where vaccine coverage is in the range of 60 to 70 percent. It's not that high. And then you look at Singapore, 90, 90 something percent, up to 95 percent soon, I imagine. Um, so, so Israel's high death rate is not a failure of the vaccines. It's just the, the failure to get a very high vaccine coverage. And that's presumably to do with the policies that they, they didn't think it was it was uh, justified to push really hard to, to force everybody to get vaccinated. And we see in some European countries, they're worried the vaccination coverage isn't that high. And they're talking about things like mandatory vaccination um, as, as a way to, to minimize the impact of COVID. Other places are, are not so keen on that kind of approach. And they think just let people make their own decision. Um, and, and if they decide not to get vaccinated, then, then that's a decision that those people will have to, to live with. But uh, they wouldn't go as far as making it mandatory. And can we talk about the mandatory uh, vaccine? Because right now, w- one of the questions earlier is, what is it to prevent the government here, Hong Kong government, from uh, a mandatory vaccine for the elderly? So what I would say to that is that, that there's a, a kind of gradation of approaches that can be taken to persuade people to get vaccinated. So the first thing is you make the vaccine available and see who wants it, who doesn't. And if you want to get the vaccine coverage higher, then you think about incentives. And it can be not only financial incentives, it can be all kinds of incentives. It can be access to certain places. Um, you can also look at penalties for not getting vaccinated. And then you can get more and more strict. And as a last resort, you can have a mandate. Now, for elderly, I would say that in, in the last year, not that much effort seems to, my, in my opinion, not that effort was made to get older people to get vaccinated. It was, it was offered to them. And then if they didn't want it, then that was OK. And, I, you know, I, so in terms of the, the impression that, that I had of what happened, that, that when older people didn't want the vaccine, the impression was that that was OK for them not to get it and just move on to other age groups and, and vaccinate other people instead. Um, so right now, I think it's kind of a, a big switch to suddenly say the vaccine's mandatory for older adults, because in my opinion, a mandate would really be a last resort, a measure of last resort. And if you look at the bookings in the vaccine centers, they're basically fully booked anyway. I didn't completely understand the rationale for mandates in Hong Kong in, in younger groups. So not, not mandates, but the vaccine pass system in younger age groups. So the vaccine coverage is, is already above 80%. And that's already very, very good in younger adults. And a mandate, in my opinion, is, 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 is not particularly necessary when you have such a high coverage. A you know, mandate would be something as a measure of last resort if people are really resistant to vaccination, but the government really wants to get a high vaccine coverage because they know that, that it's not, not safe for the entire community if there's a low vaccine coverage. In elderly, it, it, I don't know, to, to me, it, it, would, it would be a, a very strange approach to say, you know, three months ago, actually there's no real urgency to get older people vaccinated. And then now all of a sudden to say it's mandatory. Um, three months ago, why wasn't it being pushed more strongly? Why wasn't it being incentivized? Why, wasn't that, why weren't there being penalties for not being vaccinated for older people? Um, and it, if there was a concern, which I think there should have been three months ago, and I said so in, in many interviews, at that point, that would have been a time to actually think about mandates. Now it, it's kind of too late. And I don't think a mandate is necessary because even if you don't have a mandate in older people, I don't think there'll be any lack of demand among older people to get vaccinated. All you need to do and, and from the government side is to take the vaccine and make it available to older people. And if the older people can't go out to get it, then take it to them, take it to the estates, take it to the elderly homes and so on. So my opinion, I'm, I'm actually not, not really in support of a mandate at this stage. I, I don't see the need for it. Um, and I, I, I really, in public health, I don't like it when, when, when it, a mandate is jumped into. Um, I, I feel like the first step can be to encourage people and to recommend it and to advise it and give the evidence and let people make their own decisions. And if the behavior is still not there, then consider incentivizing it or, or penalizing people not doing it. And only as a last resort, really go to a mandate. Um, because I think it sets a precedent that, that may be um, undesirable in the future. Well, I, I find that you have an interesting point there. I, in terms of mandating, I think uh, my understanding is here in Hong Kong, a few months ago when the government uh, was threatening to uh, elderly cannot uh, have uh, dim sum, yam cha, uh, a lot of the elderly, because they're taking away from, you know, they want to gather with their friends and so on, uh, vaccination rate for the elderly went up. And I know in the U.S., uh, my own uh, parents, uh, because the thought of not vaccinating 
preventing them from seeing their grandchild. So right now with the, the concern of, of, mm -hmm. of you know, in fact, uh, the COVID infecting young uh, kids. So uh, I can see, and, and in fact, that's it in the U.S., in the West, not being able to see their grandchildren, got a lot of grandparents um, vaccinated. So I wonder if this is something, uh, kind of the carrot, the bigger carrots uh, is something that could have been used earlier. But anyway, we're living through what we're living through right now. And um, I want to apologize. We have a lot more questions. I think this is the most questions I've ever gotten from Slido, and there's just no way we can get to it. I'm trying to pick out the one that's uh, uh, relevant, and all of them are. Um, so I know we're going to be continuing this series, and I, I look forward to having you back. Uh, it doesn't have to be an anniversary. I think we always learn a lot from you, uh, Professor Cowling. And, uh, and next week, we will have one of your colleagues uh, joining us. So along, especially in this uh, fifth wave, we want to uh, shed light on all of these concerns, whether it's uh, impacting on uh, uh, the elderly, the, the children, and um, just the whole public health uh, issue in here we're facing here in Hong Kong. So we'll continue the series. But I kind of want to end, um, you know, and we will we'll, uh, go over our one hour to give you, uh, Professor Kelly, an opportunity to share with us uh, about kind of your long-term and short-term um, concerns. Uh, short-term uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the positives and negatives. Uh, short-term meaning, you know, maybe the spring, you know, what are some of the things that we can look forward to or something that we should be worried about? And then the long-term, uh, I think you, you've called it right a couple of times. I'm going back back to view uh, our, our interview uh, last year, you, you warned us it was not going to be uh, over. Uh, in fact, he, you kind of said it, we, it, it, by the summer of 2022, we might, might be able to travel again. So I'm hoping you're right on that one. But kind of you know, your, your perspective from where you are, uh, having seen, been in Europe, and, then, and, and, and we, somebody's asking you, when are you coming back? Uh, so asking you know, the, the short term, uh, what you're uh, positive uh, and, and concerned about, and then the long term, what are your uh, concerns and and uh, and what are you looking forward to? Well, with, with COVID right now, I'm I'm really very concerned about the, the short term uh, situation. What we've seen in the past, I think, month is infections doubling every maybe three days. Infections doubling every three days. Now, of course, the case count is not the full picture. We know there's some people who get infected and don't ever get confirm maybe they didn't know they had the uh, infection maybe they they got symptoms but they didn't want to get tested for whatever reason there's definitely going to be more infections than cases we've seen evidence that infections have increased uh exponentially doubling every three days for about a month now and that's going to continue i can't see uh the likelihood that that's going to change in terms of the trajectory unless there's a major shift in the policy in hong kong for example a citywide lockdown that i think may, may not be feasible but if that were to happen, it would slow down transmission. Assuming that, that we don't have any major change in, in, in control measures, we have continued doubling of infections every three days. And that means we're going to have a peak in our epidemic uh, in early to mid-March. And the reason there's going to be a peak is not because public health measures stop transmission. It's because the virus essentially runs out of people to infect. Not that it infects everybody, but it infects a sufficient number of people in the population that does there's less opportunity to, to spread than there was before. And that will happen in, in about uh, 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 probably three weeks time. Uh, it's difficult to say for sure, but something like that at a point when uh, a significant fraction of the population have been infected, unfortunately. If it's doubling every three days and it's going for another three weeks, that's still a lot of doublings to go on top of the current case counts. Uh, now, of course, remember the case counts will probably not be able to keep up with infections. And fairly soon, we'll most likely see changes in terms of uh, who's can be admitted to hospital because at the minute we're still intending to admit all cases. I know that they're not, they're on a waiting list, but there's no way that, that we can allow that waiting list to get longer and longer and longer. And there's consequences of, of still having a policy of admitting every case. And for example, I know there's people in quarantine right now who've tested positive, who are stuck in quarantine. They can't leave quarantine at the end of their quarantine because they're positive but they can't be admitted to hospital because there's no space for them. So they're in limbo. They're kind of not really in quarantine, but they're in quarantine. They should be in isolation, but they can't go to the isolation facilities. So they're, they're in limbo. And that's not really a, a difficult situation to be in. I know there's many people who, who are tested positive, but waiting at home to go to hospital. And then family members are quarantining. It would ordinarily be a 14-day quarantine. 
But when the, the infected person's at their home, of course, the quarantine will keep getting extended because it's 14 days after the last exposure. So that's going to cause problems as well. So I, I would expect to see a change in the quarantine policy as well fairly soon. Otherwise, the city's going to grind to a halt. Um, and unfortunately, when the infections reach a peak, that's when there's a lot of infections have already occurred. And then at the peak, remember, that's only half of the epidemic curve. You have a lot of infections going up and then you have a lot of infections on the way down as well. And so within a couple of months, um, with the current uh, epidemic trajectory, it looks very much like more than half the population would be infected. And, and possibly more than that, depending on how well the vaccines are working, depending on the fine tuning of the control measures and so on. And that's going to correspond to a lot of more serious cases, unfortunately. Um, and in terms of the mortality that we've seen so far, I, I, I'm really worried that there's going to be more. And the actions taken even now would be able to, to minimize that eventual number. I don't see a, a, an easy way to stop the, the course of the epidemic, but there are many ways in which it could be mitigated. Things like daily testing of the staff in elderly homes, things like um, a change to home isolation of patients and home quarantine and clear communication about what that involves and how to limit transmission within the home, which I haven't heard an awful lot of. I heard about hand hygiene and opening windows. Um, but what if people live in a, in a single room in a subdivided flat? What, what's the solution then? And that's a, a scenario where actually field hospitals can play a role. You could say if there's a case in a, in a crowded setting at home, that's when there should be a space available in Asia World Expo for a mild case, where ordinarily they won't admit mild cases, but if it's a crowded home, then they will. And, and, and this kind of thing is mitigation, whereas at the minute the focus is still very much on containment, which I, I think more lives will ultimately be saved in this wave if, if we have a, a more timely switch over to mitigation to try and minimize the consequences of this epidemic. Then looking further into the future, it's very difficult to know how the virus is going to change. But I think that there's no shortage of demand now for vaccines. So in terms of the, the level of population immunity, it's going to be very high come the summer. And that means there wouldn't be so much justification for, for public health measures. And hopefully, Hong Kong will be able to open up and will be able to, to follow um, a timeline where the public health measures can be relaxed safely, because COVID doesn't pose much of a threat anymore. Travel can resume. Um, unfortunately, we won't have that quarantine-free travel bubble with the mainland, uh, but that would be a fragile bubble anyway, uh, even if it did start up. So that, that's one of the possibilities that by the summer things will, will tend to normalise. We may still face COVID coming back when there's a variant in the future, and we'll deal with that when it, when it happens. But uh, I hope that's, that's what we'll be talking about in, in three to six months' time. And I hope that in Hong Kong, we'll therefore be able to declare the pandemic over as well by the summer. But uh, there is another path that we might take, which is going back to the dynamic zero COVID, back to zero daily cases, back to the travel restrictions. And in that sense, prolonging the pandemic um, because of the choice of policies. But there are also, of course, as I said, advantages, uh, potential advantages to that kind of strategy. Um, for myself, I was supposed to come back to Hong Kong on Monday. Um, on on uh, This is mid-February. I was supposed to come back on Monday, but my flight was cancelled. Separately, my quarantine hotel was cancelled. And anyway, there's an eight-country blacklist. So I I'm, I'm, wouldn't be allowed to come back to Hong Kong, even if I found another hotel and another flight. Um, that's still in place until early March. I hope it will, will be lifted. And um, if that's the case, then I'll come back. But uh, the minute I'm, I'm staying in the UK visiting family and... And um, you know, I, I'll stay here for longer. I, I, I'm not one of those people that has to urgently rush back to Hong Kong. Um, I, I have some friends who have severely ill relatives who really want to rush back to Hong Kong from, from overseas and cannot. And I think that's a really you know, sad situation two years into a pandemic that, that there's still these kind of strict restrictions. Uh, one of my friends was told that um, if they want to visit their, their dying relative, uh, they, they can't give an assurance that they'd be allowed out of the quarantine hotel so they have to come back to Hong Kong first. So they have to book the flight, the quarantine hotel, and they have to wash out first as well, of course, in a third country, arrive back in Hong Kong, and then make the call to the Department of Health to see whether it's going to be possible to visit the dying relative in hospital as a special exemption, like a day trip out of the quarantine hotel. And I, I feel like that, given the level of COVID in the community right now, I, I don't think that the resources should be spent on, on those kind of things. I, I feel like it would be a good opportunity to relax travel restrictions finally after two years, but we'll have to see what happens.
Uh, personally, are you feeling safe in, in London and in UK? Uh, are you, you know, is it normal? Yeah. Uh, things are opening up. I mean, I, I felt that way in the States in the summer, but is it, uh, people are traveling uh, mass? We always yeah, go back no, to the mass it's, question. It's, Every it's, year we, I ask you about the mass question. So, it's are, pretty, it, so are, yeah, yeah. So in the UK, it's pretty normal now. Uh, there are people wearing masks when you go out and about. Um, and businesses have started, they, they, they did have a work from home policy during the Omicron wave, but that's been relaxed. So now people are out and about much more going to work uh, rather than staying at home so much and schools are open, of course. Um, and one of the things that I think is really, really a smart move in the UK is having rapid tests. So um, any, anyone in the UK can order boxes of rapid tests anytime they like and they're, they're freely available. And actually one of my household members was positive on a rapid test fairly recently. Um, and so that meant there was a case in the household and everyone was worried about the transition, but it didn't happen. Um, I didn't get COVID um, from the family member. So, so uh, because of the availability of rapid, I think that's a, something that really should be looked at in Hong Kong to make rapid tests widely available to everybody. Um, and then uh, it really can inform decisions. So if we had rapid tests available in Hong Kong, widely available for everybody, I think we'd have a much better idea of the level of infections in the community because people wouldn't need to queue up for five hours to get tested. They could simply test at home and have a way to report the result. They could also uh, make sensible decisions about isolating themselves at home. If you're rapid test positive, you isolate at home. Once the test goes negative, you can leave isolation. We can also have sensible decisions about quarantine, that if one of your family members is infected, then you need to quarantine at home. And at the minute in Hong Kong, the policy is you have to stay inside the four walls of your home for 14 days. But actually with a rapid test like this, you could say, on a morning of quarantine, if you test negative that morning, you can go out to go shopping or whatever because you're not a threat to the community. Uh, now, of course, that's not consistent with the zero COVID approach where you want to have zero chance of infections and, and zero cases and whatever. But if you're mitigating, then you have to think about sustainable strategies and, and rapid tests can help that. And of course, schools could be open. You could say kids can go to school, but every morning they have to do a rapid test and it has to be negative. And they have to you know, be able to show that whatever, and then they can go to school and it's a safe way to reopen schools. I wouldn't say it's, it's zero risk because you could have a kid that has got COVID and goes positive during the school day, but it's a minimal risk strategy. It's a low risk strategy facilitated by these, these kits, which are not particularly expensive and uh, make, make a massive difference. So I think that's a really, really good decision in the UK to make those widely available. And I, I would strongly encourage the Hong Kong government to do the same to purchase lots and lots and lots of rapid tests, make them freely available, widely available, and encourage their use. But of course, if there's still a plan to contain, to go back to zero, then the, the government would prefer to, to do the PCR testing, I'm sure, and have the results that, that, that uh, and then have the, the options of isolation and quarantine. But uh, anyway, that's uh, a bit of personal excitement. Well I think uh, that's really helpful advice uh, from uh, what we're hearing uh, from uh, the government and, and uh, chief executive has mentioned the rapid test. I think that should be available uh, to the public uh, fairly soon. And uh, I think anything to make uh, us feel better. I think right now we need uh, positive news. Uh, I, I really thought a year ago when I spoke to you that when I when we talked this year, it would be talking about ending, uh, you know, back to the normal world as we know it. Uh, but, and, and I remember, remember you even said, and I, or either you or I said, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and now we all need to realize it's another train coming. So I'm not gonna say a light at the end of the tunnel. I know we have a lot more um, to get through uh, in this next, uh, especially in light of this fifth wave. Uh, if all goes well uh, by March and when you're back, uh, we will, the fifth wave will be history. And, and we will have learned from all of this. And that's one of the reasons for this series. We keep on learning uh, and, and we will, uh, even though we're all, most of my colleagues are working from home. I'm talking to you from the office today by myself, but it's uh, thanks to the magic of technology we can have Professor Cowling uh, in UK speaking to us uh, and talking about a subject that that it's just not one of us. All of us have been impacted. Uh, when you talk about uh, loss of a loved one, I, I uh, for, unfortunately a year. Uh, almost a year ago, lost my father, and I was fortunate enough uh, to be able to uh, go back in time to say goodbye. But I know so many stories of people who are not able to, and, and the anxieties, and, and um, it's, it's been really unprecedented. And we've all gone through this um, uh, trial period, this uh, difficult time this last two years. And it's uh, hopefully this year it will uh, get better. 
and we can only uh, pray. Uh, we hope uh, when we reopen Asia Society um, Hong Kong in the uh, near future, we have a wonderful ex exhibition called Resilience, Recovery and Resurgence. Um, a very apropos title for this time that you will come back and join us in person to see this exhibition. But in the meantime, uh, I wanna wish everyone stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, this year, the tiger, uh, a lot of unpredictability, but I'm hoping this year, the tiger will bring a lot more good news for all of us. And I wanna wish uh, Professor Cowling, uh, you know, safe travels. Uh, and then uh, we look forward to welcome you back. And we have a lot of coming programs, even though we are uh, not in the office, we are still gonna be bringing you some wonderful programs online uh, in the coming weeks. And, uh, and one of uh, Professor Cowling's uh, a colleague uh, will join us, uh, Dr. Sweetheart, next week, and we will continue to uh, update you on this uh, developing situation of COVID in Hong Kong, and also finding out, learning from what's uh, happening around the world in terms of COVID. I know my colleagues, um, other Asia Society centers around the world are also uh, doing wonderful programs on COVID, and I you know, encourage you to check out our website, and our social media uh, to find out all the developments here at Asia Society Hong Kong and Asia Society Global. So have a wonderful afternoon and a good day to Professor Cowling and safe travels and look forward to seeing you back in person in Hong Kong real soon. Thank you.